The Monroe Doctrine is a U.S. policy that paved the way for U.S. imperialism in the Western Hemisphere. 200 years since its inception, and despite claims of the doctrine's expiration, U.S. intervention and imperialism is still running rampant. If it does not interfere in some country in Latin America, it is not because of a change in policy, rather, it is probably because of its diminishing power. Two centuries ago, the U.S. president announced the country's resistance against European colonization and effectively made the United States an occupier and colonizing country itself. The Monroe Doctrine The Monroe Doctrine, a U.S. policy that claimed the right for the U.S. government to intervene in the affairs of Latin America with the pretext of preventing Europeans from colonizing the region, was announced in 1823. The U.S. President James Monroe proclaimed the Monroe Doctrine 200 years ago, declaring that any attempt by European powers to colonize or interfere with the affairs of the Western Hemisphere would be viewed as a threat to U.S. national security. On the surface, the doctrine seemed to be in place to resist European colonization. However, it evolved, or was it the government's intention in the first place to have a pretext for U.S. domination in the region, allowing it to intervene in the affairs of other nations while claiming to protect U.S. interests. By the dawn of the 1820s, many Latin American countries had won independence from Spain and Portugal, yet Britain and the United States worried that European powers would yet again try to colonize the Western Hemisphere. While President James Monroe at first favored a joint U.S.-British resolution against future colonization, Secretary of State John Quincy Adams distrusted Britain's own colonial intentions, convincing Monroe to make a unilateral statement of U.S. policy, which he delivered to Congress on December 2, 1823. At the time of Monroe's bold message that the Western Hemisphere was off-limits to European interference, the young nation lacked enough military clout at the time, which made Monroe's assertion somewhat pointless until the United States became a dominating world power. The U.S. has justified its interventionism in the Western Hemisphere as necessary for protecting democracy and human rights. However, U.S. intervention has exacerbated the problems it supposedly seeks to address and the U.S. has a history of supporting authoritarian regimes in the region. In the name of democracy, human rights, and freedom, the U.S. military and CIA have been involved in coups and the suppression of democratically elected governments in support of dictators loyal to America. The Monroe Doctrine was originally a document that was implemented to regard U.S. policy in the Western Hemisphere especially after a lot of the European powers like Spain and England started losing hold on their colonies. So this was um, stated in former President James Monroe's annual message to Congress almost 200 years ago, exactly on December 2nd, 1823. And it basically just said that the European powers had to respect the Western Hemisphere as being the U.S. sphere of interests. And of course, that encompasses the Americas as well. And it meant that the U.S. had full control over its region. So these, ironically, the, the main points were to separate the spheres of influence from the Americas and Europe to de uh, destroy neocolonization. So no colonization anymore. And to put out this idea of non-interventionism. That is extremely ironic because that is what the Monroe Doctrine was said to do. And it was basically going to have a clear, distinct uh, break between the New World and Europe and the, you know, the, the monarchy, autocratical realm of Europe. <laughs>
Last year, Senator Bernie Sanders said before the Russia-Ukraine war that it is hypocritical for the U.S. to insist that it does not accept the principle of spheres of influence as a nation. He added that under the Monroe Doctrine, the U.S. has the right to intervene against any country that might threaten our alleged interests. Sanders said under the doctrine, the U.S. has overthrown and undermined at least a dozen countries throughout Latin and Central America and the Caribbean. But it is hypocritical <clears throat> for the United States to insist that we as a nation do not accept the principle of spheres of influence. For the last 200 years, our country has operated under the Monroe Doctrine, embracing the principle that as the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere, the United States has the right, according to the United States, to intervene against any country that might threaten our alleged interests. That's United States policy. And under this doctrine, the United States has undermined and overthrown at least a dozen countries throughout Latin America, Central America, and the Caribbean. The U.S. intervention in the Western Hemisphere has not been limited to military action, though. U.S. has also used economic and political pressure to influence the region. For example, U.S. has used its influence in international financial institutions to impose austerity measures on countries such as Argentina and Ecuador. It has also imposed sanctions on countries not in line with U.S. policies like Cuba and Venezuela. So how does the U.S. implement this doctrine? How that has developed and ways that we could see that playing out today um, is the Spanish-American War. Um, the U.S. wanted Spain out of um, out of the Caribbean, and so they um, they fabricated a war, which is nothing new to the U.S. Um, and after winning the war, uh, the U.S. took over Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam, Hawaii, the U.S. Virgin Islands, um, and and essentially under the good neighbor policy and under the Monroe Doctrine said, hey, we're going to help you create democracy in your countries, um, which is a lie uh, because my country, Puerto Rico, um, is currently a colony of the U.S. Uh, the U.S. invaded in 1898 using the Monroe Doctrine to justify its intervention and has, uh, and has been the colonizers of Puerto Rico since 1898. And so the Monroe Doctrine is just an, an excuse, a policy that um, that legitimizes the U.S. hegemonic holds in the Americas so that other countries um, don't get involved in um, the U.S. trying to expand its, um, its strength throughout the Americas and eventually throughout the world. Two centuries after the U.S. president set the Monroe Doctrine as the country's foreign policy with regards to the Western Hemisphere, instead of European colonization, the U.S. is worried about the expansion of influence and the incorporation of growing powers such as Iran, China, and Russia with Latin and Central American countries. Since instead of domination, these countries are cooperating through mutual interests, the imperialist U.S. government is right to feel concerned in losing influence. The Monroe Doctrine was afraid, uh, was talking about the fear of the United States in intervention from Europe in Latin America and in other U.S., uh, in other Caribbean territories at that point, meaning that the Latin America had just freed itself from Spain and the U.S. did not want that to happen. But the way it's posed in Western uh, education is that they did this out of the goodness of, you know, this moral super uh, superiority that they didn't want interference. But the reality was actually that they did they wanted to exert their own dominance over these regions and their own influence. And they were also concerned about Russia's expansion at that time as well into uh, from Alaska into the Oregon area. And they didn't want Russia to continue to expand. So um, how that's being implemented now is absolutely different. 
like I sort of started to mention, it's being used as a uh, means to actually control these regions uh, rather than prevent non-intervention from other countries. It's to ensure that the United States has control. Since start of the 21st century, China has been rapidly growing its role in Latin America. Chinese firms have been investing broadly in the region's energy, infrastructure, and space industries, passing the United States as the region's largest trading partner. China has also been expanding its military, diplomatic, and culture presence. Just recently, China and Brazil have decided to trade with their own currencies and ditch the U.S. dollar. We can definitely say um, that the U.S. is very much scared. Um, Iran, China, Russia are going to countries like Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba, and really growing the economic relationship um, that has existed in a way that allows for more infrastructure to be built. And a Central and South America with infrastructure um, is a country uh, creates um, a reality where these developing countries can now develop in ways um, that allow them to to have a larger say in who they want to do business with. And so we see uh, once again that the U.S. influence in these countries um, is is still a thing, but it's becoming. Um, far weaker, and this is scary to the U.S. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said in late March, the U.S. should abandon its outdated Monroe Doctrine and respect the rights of other countries in making independent foreign policy decisions. In recent years, Panama, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua have established or resumed diplomatic relations with China. Wong added, any sovereign state has a right to develop diplomatic relations with other countries independently. China, of course, is the largest economy in the world right now that we're seeing. And the, the rise of BRICS has really, really threatened the U.S. unilateral hold on the entire world, which was originally, as we recall, right, the Western Hemisphere, but then expanded pretty much into everywhere. And so the um, rise of the relationships between Russia and China, both with Latin American countries, is seen as a threat. We recently saw Honduras end its relationship with Taiwan and recognize the China One policy with uh, China and recognize that Taiwan is China. That is a significant development. It may not seem so, but that was huge because for the longest time, Honduras had that relationship. And Nicaragua as well always had a relationship with Taiwan, but they know what's going on is this multipolar world that is emerging. And what we're seeing is when China does something uh, for example, where they say, OK, we'll help you out. We'll, you know, we'll help build these roads, these these bridges, et cetera. They don't come back with, oh, by the way, you know, you have to do this. You can't talk to this uh, person. You have to do that. Like they allow these countries to have their own national sovereignty. U.S. politicians who are worried about their country's hegemony over the region believe that response to Chinese influence in Latin America has been insufficient and poorly coordinated. Some argue U.S. needs to provide more economic aid and investment to the region in order to compete with China's deep pockets. Others argue the U.S. needs to reevaluate its approach to the region, focusing on cooperation and mutual benefit rather than competition with China.
So should the U.S. be concerned over the influence of Iran, Russia, and China in Latin America? John Kerry um, trying to attack uh, the nations of Russia and China um, and Iran and saying, um, that these are scary developments, that they're having larger influence um, in Latin America, it makes sense. They're having larger influences in Central and South America because Central and South American countries are tired of doing business with the U.S. Last year, during developments in Ukraine, Russia harshly criticized the U.S. for the Monroe Doctrine, claiming America is trying to turn the entire world into one giant vassal state. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said in the United Nations that the U.S. has been trying to turn the entire globe into its backyard while using illegitimate unilateral sanctions against those who disagree. The notorious Monroe Doctrine is becoming global in scope. Washington is trying to turn the entire world in its own, into its own backyard. And the way of doing this is through unlawful unilateral sanctions, which have been for many years used in violation of the Charter and used as a tool of political blackmail. The U.S. has a long history of coup d'etats in Latin America. For example, in 1976, it supported the military dictatorship of Jorge Rafael Vidila that overthrew the democratically elected government and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger visited the dictatorship several times. In 1971, the U.S. supported the coup in Bolivia and in 1973, the CIA was involved in the coup against the Chilean president Salvador Allende and the installment of the infamous dictator Augusto Pinochet. This doctrine has expanded, right? It has been used to justify countless interventions and coups. So, for example, in, uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti, the U.S. Marines were sent uh, into uh, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic in 1904. They were sent into Nicaragua since far as far back as 1911 and Haiti in the beginning in 1915. And in between that, there have been countless interventions in Latin America the Caribbean, as well as Africa, because this is also talking about the global south and um, in general that encompasses also Asia and East Southeast Asia as well. But in 1962, of course, the the big one is that this Monroe Doctrine was involved um, in basically when the Soviet Union was trying to build up a, 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 the missile launching sites in Cuba, right? And they were saying, that they were going to attack the United States. Well, this is known as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the United States used its support of the OAS or the Organization of American States during that time with President John F. Kennedy to uh, throw a, the naval and air quarantine around the island. In 2013, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry declared that the Monroe Doctrine that governed Washington's relations with Latin America was over. He said that all the countries in America should be viewed as equals and share responsibilities. Although that same year he had said earlier that the Western Hemisphere is our backyard, prompting Bolivian President Evo Morales to expel the U.S. aid agency, USAID, from his country. In the early days of our republic, the United States made a choice about its relationship with Latin America. President James Monroe, who was also a former Secretary of State, declared that the United States would unilaterally and, as a matter of fact, act as the protector of the region. The doctrine that bears his name asserted our authority to step in and oppose the influence of European powers in Latin America. And throughout our nation's history, successive presidents have reinforced that doctrine and made a similar choice. Today, however, we have made a different choice. The era of the Monroe Doctrine is over. The relationship, that's worth applauding, that's not a bad thing. Despite John Kerry's declaration about the end of the Monroe Doctrine, U.S. continues to intervene in the Western Hemisphere. In 2019, 
the opposition in Venezuela called Nicolas Maduro's inauguration illegitimate and Juan Guaido declared himself as a rightful president and took the presidential oath at a rally in Caracas. Not surprisingly, the United States almost immediately recognized Guaido as president, intervening again in the internal affairs of a Latin American country. So has the Monroe Doctrine actually ended? Well, I can tell you for certain, um, I can tell you for certain that as someone that lives here um, in the U.S., that the Monroe Doctrine is not over. It has definitely changed. It has developed. Um, into um, into something new, but we very much see the U.S. trying to impose its views. It just now is trying to do it behind the scenes. So it will use individuals from um, from any country that is trying to intervene in uh, to implement policies that benefit the U.S. without the U.S. having to um, to necessarily be the face of the intervention. Um, and we can look at uh, the U.S.'s involvement uh, in the Middle East, the U.S. using NATO to expand its influence throughout Europe, um, and uh, the U.S. meddling in, um, with Taiwan um, and making false claims to, to push foreign influences to think that it is uh, it is other countries that are trying to take advantage um, of developing countries or places and not the U.S. trying to maintain its influence um, and maintain its economic stronghold that it has in, um, in the places where it once didn't have to fight. In addition to Chinese and Russian influence, the United States is also very concerned about Iranian activities in the region and views these activities as a potential threat to its national security interests, while it sees no problem with its own years of interference in the West Asia region. In February, two Iranian warships docked in Rio de Janeiro in defiance to the U.S. and despite pressures from the U.S. government to not allow the warships to dock. In terms of U.S. foreign policy um, and how it will develop, um, we are going to see we're going to see a lot of extremes happening. the The U.S. is going to do its its level best to maintain power in the nations that it still has a fairly large interest um, and influence in. But so we're going to see more U.S. military intervention. Um, we just saw the U.S. being so willing to send military forces to Haiti. That's going to be something that as um, some of these countries um, begin to, um, to experience or continue to experience um, destabilization efforts, um, that the U.S. will, will volunteer to help. Um, to bring democracy and to bring stability to these countries um, or to give the impression that it is um, doing these things. And, and so the U.S. is going to try to focus uh, a lot more on things that are closer to home. But the thing is that the country, some of the countries that it used to be able to take advantage of um, or that it used to depend on um, for certain things, uh, will no longer be sitting at that table. Iran has also been growing its ties with Nicaragua and expanding relationships with other countries in the region like Venezuela. These developments show that despite U.S. hostilities towards Iran, and even though it does not seem that the U.S. will willingly set the Monroe Doctrine aside, its dwindling power is forcing it to accept new realities that are very rapidly developing. How do you see the future of U.S. foreign policy? The future of the U.S. foreign policy um, is changing. It's waning. It's, it's dec decreasing. OK, um, we we're seeing the rise of multipolarity or multilateralism. So we went from the last hundred years of unilateral control by the West, particularly at this point, then led by the United States, where they could dictate 
the foreign policy being the biggest economy, the biggest leaders. What we're seeing now, because of sort of, I think there was this. 200 years has passed since U.S. President James Monroe initiated a doctrine that resulted in intervention, coup, occupation, economic interference and sanctions, CIA assassinations and meddling, supporting dictatorships and casting misery and suffering on most people in the region. Now, with the decline of U.S. power, the government is forced to ignore one of its long-lasting doctrines and accept that many other world powers may be present and influential in their so-called backyard. <laughs>